So this talk is probably more philosophical and conceptual than last time. It's much more recent work. Uh, there are two papers that appeared last year in AAAI and, and NeurIPS uh, on harm. The first one looks at the qualitative notion of harm. Was there harm or not? The second one looks at a more quantitative version. Um, so, and I'm sort of combining both papers in this talk. Uh, this is joint work with Hannah Chokler, uh, who's at King's College, and Sander Beckers, who was my postdoc, is now a postdoc at Amsterdam. So, you know, why should we care? I mean, why is a computer scientist talking about harm? Uh, so, I, I, I think I'm saying obvious things, but let me say them anyway. Uh, uh, AI systems are placing, uh, are, are playing a leading role these days. That's all you hear about in the news. But if you look at Europe's draft AI act, it has, I think I counted at one point, it was like 37 references that use the word harm. And it'll say things like, it's appropriate to classify AI systems as high risk if in the light of their intended purpose, they pose a high risk of harm to the health and safety of individuals. But we have to take into account the severity of the possible harm and its probability of occurrence. So they use harm all over the place. But then you find a little footnote that says, oh, we're going to use harm all over the place. We actually have to define harm. What does it mean to say that there is harm? That's what this talk is about, right? So it's sort of interesting. They use the word all the time. And then it's like they got the sudden realization that if you're really going to say you shouldn't do harm, so exactly what does it mean? So it turns out philosophers have thought about this. Uh, but there's this paper by Bradley that got me really annoyed. I'll explain why in a second. So let me quote from that paper. It says, unfortunately, when we look at attempts to explain the nature of harm, we find a mess. The most widely discussed account, the comparative account, faces counterexamples that seem fatal. My diagnosis is that the notion of harm is a Frankensteinian jumble. I love that. Uh, it should be replaced by other more well-behaved notions. So, okay, so I read this paper, um, and I said, if these guys had only read my paper on causality, they would have seen that half of, so they're using a counterfactual account. And for those of you who were here last week, you know that the definition of causality that I gave, which goes back to a long tradition, also uses counterfactuals. Um, and at least half of their counterexamples would literally, and, and they understood that causality was important. They wanted to talk about causing harm. Half of their counterexamples would have gone away if they just used our definition. Now, our paper was published, I forget what year, but definitely before 2012, the original paper. And it was published in a philosophy journal. So it's not like it's computer science. They have an excuse for not being aware of it. And I actually give a bunch of invited talks at philosophy workshops and conferences. So it is actually pretty well known in philosophy, but not to this small community that was doing harm. So I have to admit, at a personal level, I got annoyed by this paper. So that inspired me to do harm. So maybe it was a good thing. Um, so is the situation that bad? And I claim, no, it's not. That, that as a first step, we're going to use our definition. I'll explain that at a very high level. But there's another key ingredient. It turned out that just using our definition wasn't enough. That we had to add utility to the picture. So when you talk about a harm, we have to talk about how much you care about stuff that's being modeled by utility. And it turned out that we needed a default utility. And the intuition is that there's harm only if the agent is worse off than they expect to be even if only if their utility is worse than the default. I'll make that precise. But that's the idea. And that turned out to be the key new ingredient on top of our definition of causality to basically make all their counterexamples go away. Um, so I'm going to do a two-slide review of my talk last week. Um, so I think this is good enough. I said the talk. this talk was self-contained. So hopefully, that'll for those of you who weren't there last week, this will be enough to give you a sense of what was going on. So in the talk, I used causal models. And the idea is that the world is described by a bunch of variables. And the variables are related to each other by these equations called structural equations. So I can say things like variable y 
is x plus z, or x plus z, depending on where you learned your English. Um, so if you think of a Bayesian network, those of you familiar with that, we have a variable y. It has parents x and z. And instead of a conditional probability, which is what you would have in a Bayesian network, you have an equation that gives you the value of y as a function of the values of its parents. That's how the structural equations of model works. Um, and using those values, once I tell you the values of the variables at the top, what we call the exogenous variables, that will determine the values of everything else. In the basic model, there's no probability. They're all deterministic equations. So we can describe what's going on using a graph, as I said, like a Bayesian network, for those of you familiar with that. And at the top, we have what are called the exogenous variables. That, that's the U there. There can be a lot. And the values of those variables are given outside the model. They're just, you know, that's the way the world is. U is three, right? Uh, the values of all the other variables, in this case, the x1, the x2, and x3, are determined by equations. So there'd be an equation for x1 that would tell you the value of x1 as a function of its parent, which in this case is y. There's an equation for x2 that tells you the value of x2 as a function of its parents, which is also sorry, not y, but u. And finally, there's a, there'd be an equation for x3 that tells you its value as a function of x1 and x2, because those are its parents. Right, that's the idea. So once I tell you the value of u, I can figure out the values of everything else just going down the tree, down the dag, technically. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, that's, that's good enough. So I'm going to write my only teeny bit of notation, given a, what we call a context, a setting of the exogenous variables, the ones at the top. Once I know the context, once I know the model, and the model is basically the equations. So given the equations and the values of the variables at the top, I can figure out everything else. So that's B, that's, you know, is it true that X is three and X three is two and X two is seven? I can figure that out once I know the stuff at the top. Uh, Lenore. Sorry. It's okay. It's, I, it's not, I, I don't know. I didn't use the word additive. It, it doesn't have to be addition. Well, I gave an example that, that X is, is Y. That's an example of an equation. But the equations could be arbitrary. Uh, it could be x equals y times u. It could be x is the max of y and u. Uh, the equations are arbitrary. That's just an example of an equation. Um, so uh, I'm going to slightly extend the definition. I want to define what it means for x being 3 rather than x being 2 being a cause, cause of phi, because that's what they do in this literature. So it's not just that x is 3 is a cause of phi, but x being 3 rather than x being 2 being a cause of 3. And, and, and the intuition is, um, so when I talk about causality, my focus here is going to be on what I call, what lawyers call, and uh, but for causality. If x had had a different value, then phi would not have happened. So if I push Raphael and he falls over. I like to say my push is a cause of him falling, falling over because if I hadn't pushed him, he wouldn't have fallen. So if I had a variable that represents the push and it has value one if I push him and zero if I don't push him, the fact that that variable has value one caused him to fall, had it had value zero, had I not pushed him, he wouldn't have fallen. That's the idea. Now in general, the variables that are causes can have multiple values. They're not necessarily binary. It's not zero or one. Um, so here I want to say, well, the fact that x is three rather than it being two was a cause of phi. He said, if I'd switched x from being three to being two, then phi wouldn't have happened. So I'm just being more explicit about the change that needs to be made in order to get the counterfactual, in order to get Raphael not to fall. And again, I didn't last week, but here for simplicity, I'm going to assume but for causality. Um, in general, it's not the case that you can demonstrate causality. It's not the case that you can say x is being three is a cause of phi 
if I can change X3 to something else, V won't happen. Things can be more complicated, but for this talk, they're not gonna be more complicated, right? You had to come to last week's talk to understand the complexity. Um, so roughly speaking, um, so for the purposes of this talk, there's gonna be three conditions for causality. The first and third are exactly the same as last week. The second is simplified to get but for causality. So I would never say that A is a cause of B if it's not the case that both A and B happened. That's what AC1 says. I'm not gonna say that X equal capital X being little X is a cause of B. By the way, those vector symbols are because I allow a, that vector X could be like X1 being three and X2 being five and X3 being four, right? So this is setting a bunch of values of X to certain values is a cause of B if, well, first, again, I wouldn't say that me pushing Raphael is a cause of him falling if I didn't actually push him and he didn't actually fall. That's just not the way it works in English. So the first requirement to say that X being three is a cause of B is that in fact, X was three and B happened. And the third requirement, remember this is a vector of variables, not a single variable in general. So it would be like me pushing Raphael and Eric pushing Raphael and North pushing the three of us together pushing him. That's what caused him to fall. But I don't want to say that the three of us pushing him and me sneezing caused him to fall. Sneezing is irrelevant. So AC3 says no irrelevant variables are being set next. So AC1 and AC3 non controversial. And all the action happened in AC2. AC2 last week was complicated. For the purposes of this week, I'm focusing on but for causality, and that's this. So the way you should read this, especially if you weren't here last week, if I were to intervene and set, X is actually three, but if I were to intervene and set it to two, if I were to intervene and set it to X prime, then phi would be false. So if somehow I could imagine a world where I didn't push Raphael, then he wouldn't fall. Sorry? Um, sorry, I'm not sure where you're looking. Ah, that should, that's a typo. Uh, forget the fee prime. Yeah, it should be fee prime, but for the purpose of this talk, fee is binary, so. Um, you're right, but you should correct that slide. All right, so now, uh, yeah. That's a good point. Um, so this is, you know, ultimately, let's go back to, uh, it's important to define harm. And they were interested in really, what does it mean that A caused B harm? So they're, they're actually will, willing to look here retrospectively. That, that turns out to be good enough for the purposes of, of uh, if you look at the AI draft act, you know, they pose a high risk of harm. So we want to say, okay, was there harm in this case? Is, is the question they're really answering. And, and that's what we're addressing. So let's, let's be clear. So in case it isn't obvious, feel free to ask questions. Um, so let me, okay. So what I wanna start by defining, at least for the next few slides, when I say qualitative harm, is simply was there harm or not, not the degree of harm. So to make sense out of the question of was there harm or not, I'm gonna look at causal models. So I'm gonna have a causal model. Remember for me, a causal model is basically a set of, well, let me say, it's a set of exogenous variables, the ones at the top of the graph, like the U, a set of endogenous variables, the other variables, and the equations that connect, that they tell you the value of, the, of each endogenous variable as a function of its parents. Okay, that's what a model is. So I'm gonna have a model. Why do I want a causal model? Well, again, think about English. I wanna say this action caused harm. We use the word causality in English with harm. It's quite standard. So I'm gonna take that seriously and we're gonna talk about causing harm. But in addition, I'm gonna have a utility function. Uh, now utility function, so it turns out that to simplify life, I'm going to assume the causal model has a bunch of variables. One of the variables I'm gonna call the outcome, call it O for simplicity. And the utility function is just defined in O. So if 
the outcome variable has value three, what's the utility of getting outcome three? If the outcome variable is values, value seven, what's the utility of outcome seven? This is a simplification, just for ease of exposition. I mean, think standard utility and decision theory. That's that's what I'm doing. I mean, utility standard, for those of you who know decision theory, I mean, basically the back of my mind, I have savage-like models with states and outcomes. So you have a space of outcomes and I'm assigning utility to outcomes. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. For this talk, I have a variable O, it has different values and associated with each value, I have an, a utility. And that's what this utility function is doing, this right there. Um, and finally, I have a, a number that's a default utility, which intuitively, roughly, is the utility that I think is reasonable to get. That's how to think about it. So is that a question back there? No, okay. Um, so I'm going to say that the action, again, vector x just means, you know, x1 being 1 and x2 being 7 and x3 being 4 causes harm to an agent given this model. So again, just like causality last week, harm is going to be relative to a model. We can disagree about the model, and we might very well disagree about the model, and we'll get different evaluations as to whether or not there was harm. In particular, for example, we could disagree about the utilities. We could disagree about the default, even if we completely agree about the causal model. And as you'll see, that disagreement will lead one person to say, yes, there was harm, another person to say, no, there wasn't. Sorry, question. Yeah, so the way that, you're right. I mean, there's nothing here that depends on the agent. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. I, largely, but not completely, you should think of this as the agent's utility, but it could also be society's utility in the sense that, that you know, if I think about the European draft clause, I mean, to make sense out of this, they would have to assign utilities to outcomes. Now, whose utility is it? Well, the committee gets together and assigns numbers. Somebody might die, what's the utility of death? So there is a committee in the States that actually came up with numbers for, for death and, and so on. So, uh, um, so um, is there a harm? Well, I'm gonna look at the actual out. So you did X equals X, we have the equations that tell us what happened. So I know the value of the variable O if, x equals x happened. So in the real world, it was x equals x happened. Uh, the outcome had some value little o. I'm only going to say that there's harm if the utility of o is less than the default. This will make more sense when you get to examples. But again, the default is part of the model. Doesn't count as harm unless you were worse off than you expect it to be. Um, and finally, you could have done better. So all this complicated English is saying you could have done better. Let's make that precise. There exists an O prime and an X prime. O prime is just a different value of the outcome. X prime is a different setting of X. So if you had done X prime rather than X, that would have caused, so you see I am using the rather than, O prime rather than O. Um, and the utility of O prime is greater than the utility of O. So you, you could have done better. That's all this is saying. There's something that you could have done. That, uh, it's, I'm not requiring that it's better than the default. But O is already better than the default. Um, otherwise, there, so O is worse than default. O prime doesn't have to be worse than default. Um, so let me give you an example of using the default and why we care. So suppose we had a $30 meal at a restaurant and Alice decides not to tip the waiter and keeps money for herself. Did she harm the waiter? Well, I would say it depends. In a country like the US where it's customary to tip 15 to 20%, we can take the default to be, let's say 15%, 450. And the fact that Alice didn't, didn't tip the waiter meant she harmed the waiter. He was expecting 450, 450 was the default. He didn't get, he got zero. So he got harmed. But in countries like Japan, where tips are literally not expected, you can run after you and give you back the tip. They thought you left it behind by mistake. Then um, it seems reasonable to take the default to be zero. The waiter doesn't feel the least bit harmed for not getting a tip. He wasn't expecting one. 
No, Europe is somehow more complicated. Uh, Israel also that TIF is included in the bill, and, and and but still people leave a little bit. But that's okay. I mean, the default is what it is. We can debate what a reasonable default is. Um, but it's part of the model. And I'm hoping this sort of makes clear that, that you can have different expectations in different places. You'll take different um, different defaults. So whether or not you harm somebody by not leaving a tip depends on the model, depends on the default. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Ah, interesting question. So the question is, um, it turned out to be useful, I will say here, that, that we should say, uh, I mean, look at this example, that, that I don't know how to determine from, you know, inside the model, everything looks the same. Alice went for a meal. The meal cost $30. Uh, she had the option of leaving a tip. She didn't. Now, how am I going to determine, you know, what features the model are going to determine endogenously somehow what the default should have been in that case. It, but we should we can talk about it afterwards, but it's just not clear to me how with this example, um, which in some sense you could say is identical in all respects except for the default, um, what endogenous features in the model are gonna determine the tip. But I, so I have a student who's, I mean, I have this whole other talk on normality, what, what what's normal. And I, I talked about it a little bit last week where uh, for those of you who are here, remember the example where where um, uh, the receptionist had two pens on her desk, and one was taken by the professor, one was taken by a, a, an admin, but the rule in the department was the pens are for the admins. So although each of the professor and the admin were but for causes of there not being any pens available when somebody else came and wanted to take a pen, they weren't judged the same way because the rule was the pens were for the admins, not the professor. So the professor did something more abnormal than the admin. Um, and so I have a student, and, and this to some extent might address your question. If we were to enrich the model with normality, and here it would work, because in Japan, it's perfectly normal not to tip. Whereas in the US, I think it's fair to say it, it's abnormal. Now, what does abnormal mean? Well, statistically, it's unlikely, but also, there, it's more than just statistics. There's a certain expectation, moral expectation is too strong, but some kind of an expectation that you'll tip, right? So it's normal to tip in the States by some reasonable definition of the word normal. Uh, so the student is thinking about how you can use normality to determine the default. So if you're willing to have enriched models with normality, that in a sense would make the default more endogenous. So that's exactly what he's doing. Um, but it requires a richer model than I'm talking about here. Uh, Yisha. Mm -hmm. Right. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I would allow that. So here I was looking at a specific case, but, but in, in general, yeah, so if you think about the context as telling you, yes. So if you think of the context as saying how much the meal cost, you'd have different defaults in different contexts that would be context dependent, quite literally context dependent in the formal sense of the word context here. Uh, and also in the informal sense of English. Uh, so certainly I would, I, I would want a lot of that. Um, so the default can be used as describing the expectation. As, as you said, the expectation can be a function of other features. Um, and, and it's interesting that there is, we found this after we wrote the paper, but there are all sorts of psych, psychology experiments that weren't looking at harm at all, but we're looking at the role of default expectations. And there's lots of evidence to show that, or lots, there's a reasonable amount of evidence to show that people do have defaults and how they feel is very much a function of those defaults. So this is not, yes, we have it in our theory, but there, there there's, psychological evidence that, that this is not unreasonable. Um, but of course, people can disagree on, on the default and it could represent society's expectation. So if you're a policymaker trying to figure out what the defaults ought to be, this is 
non-trivial, right? Um, okay, so that was qualitative harm. And now I want to switch to quantitative harm, but there's a question. Sorry? 50 percent give a good, good question. So it, we have nothing to say. It, so let, let me be explicit, but in, in a sense, trying to answer your question. Uh, for us, everything is model relative. So all I have to, you know, all I'm going to talk about is given this model, here's whether or not there's harm relative to the model. Now, it's a totally separate question and a super important question that I really am not going to address, but let me highlight the question. What's the right, right model, right? And I put right in air quotes. This is really important. If you're a policymaker trying to decide in the policy, where should I, you know, who has to go back to work if there's a pandemic? We're going to say emergency workers have to go back to work. Who are the emergency workers? So you have to decide on utilities and you have to build a model. It's not the least bit obvious how you should do this and what the right, again, the right in quotes utilities are. So I want to say we have nothing to say about that in the paper or in the talk. For us, everything is, but, but you're asking the question, suppose it's half. What's a reasonable thing to do? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand. So you can imagine a distribution. So I'm willing to allow the um, the default to be context dependent. And I'm, I'm perfectly happy to have a distribution of a context. In fact, I'm going to have that. So here you can imagine one context where the default is zero, another context where the default is 15%, whatever, uh, and the distribution, you know, a, a probability on, on the context. And in your case, it would be 50-50, so one half, one half. Um, and, and in fact, I'm going to explicitly do that. So stay tuned. Um, so, so let me briefly talk about, you know, the, what's the obvious definition of quantitative harm? Well, basically, you're looking at how far off you are from the default. So all this complication, complicated expression is saying is, um, if I want to look at the quantitative harm caused by a particular action x prime, x equals x prime, relative to x. Um, so, sorry, you did x. You could have done x prime. Had you done x prime, what would we take the harm to be in that case? Well, I compare the utility you would have gotten had you done x prime compared to the utility that you got doing x, and I also compare it to the default. So formally, I'm saying, Look at what you would have gotten with x prime and look at the difference between what you would have gotten with x prime, that's the u of o prime, and what you got with x, that's this. But also look at the default and look at the difference between what you got in the default and what you got with what you would have gotten otherwise. Take the minimum of those two and the harm is never less than zero. So the way to think about, you know, here's an example. Um, if you, well, there's an example coming up, I think. Back to Alice in the restaurant. Suppose Alice eats a meal for $50. The utility for the tip is, uh, for a tip is X dollars. So utility is just dollars. Uh, tips can only be given in cash and Alice has only $5 in her wallet. If she gives a $5 tip, then the, in a simple model where she just, she just had five dollars in her wallet. She can't run out to an ATM to get more money. So she gives her five dollars. She gives all that she can give, and in that case, there's no harm because there's no alternative action she could have performed in this simple model, where she could have done anything else. So, let me sort of go back to here. The qualitative harm is look at all the actions that Alice could have performed, all the x primes and look at the harm for each of them and take the worst case, right? That's, this is the harm if she did X prime compared to, you know, how much harm did X cause given that she could have done X prime and look at the worst case X prime. That's the amount of harm there was. Sort of the obvious thing if you think about it. And what I'm saying is if all she could have done is give $5 and she gave $5, the harm is zero because she couldn't have given more in a model where she can't run out to the ATM 
you don't allow her the option of she should have thought beforehand and gotten money for a tip, right? We can imagine more complicated models where Alice did cause harm, right? Suppose the model included an action where before she went to the restaurant, she actually went to a bank and got some money. For whatever reason, she didn't do that. Then there would have been an alternative action where she went to the bank, got money. She could have tipped the waiter 750. And in that case, there would have been harm because tipping the waiter 750 would have been an option, right? So again, this, this, the point here is that whether or not there's harm is model relative. And the model includes things like alternative actions, which would include things like whether, you know, how much, what you could have done. Uh, oh, Uh, let me talk about benefit. Let me put benefit in the stack. I'm going to come to it at the end of the talk. Uh, and, and the answer is we certainly want to talk about benefit, but it's not completely symmetric. So stay tuned. Uh, now, if Alice had $10 in her wallet and gives a tip of $750, uh, then if she gives a tip of $750, then again, there's no harm because when we looking at harm, we max out at the default, right? She could have given $10. But we wouldn't say there was a harm of 250, even though she could have given ten dollars, because 750 was already the default. So that's what that's what's going on here. With we compare it to the default, we compare it to what she actually did, um, and and we take the better of the two essentially, right? So all right, that's uh, Eric. Okay. You went to the ATM. Right. And the ATM was out of school. Then, it, then, then giving a higher tip would not be feasible, and, and there's no harm in our picture. Now, this is harm. So it's interesting. The waiter, let's assume, that had no idea that the, the ATM was out of service. So you can imagine a richer model where we take into account the waiter's beliefs, and then there's harm again uh, from the waiter's point of view. So we can imagine harm from society's point of view. Uh, if she goes to court and says, well, you know, she's accused of not giving the waiter the full tip. And she says, I tried, but the ATM was out of service. That's closer to this. But then if you look at it from the waiter's subjective point of view, we can definitely have a model that takes into account the waiter's beliefs and from the waiter's perspective, there was harm. Because she sort of knew how much money she had. She would know whether she could order a less expensive meal. Uh, okay, so then, then we can debate. I, again, um, that's a fair point. And, and Look, this comes up in the law all the time. It's, it, it, you know, you made it out like a, like, gee, this is funny. This could happen. But in fact, these things are, are, are what lawyers argue about. So this is absolutely not silly. I mean, it's, uh, um, but let me point out issues here. Uh, I mean, I suspect most of you have seen, are familiar with standard decision theory, where we talk about expected utility. We can certainly talk about expected harm. Um, suppose we have uncertainty about what happens. So for me, this is what I didn't get to in last week's talk because it was cut short. Uh, although the basic model of causality doesn't have probability, the equations are all deterministic, I'm perfectly happy to deal with probability. I would put probability on the context. So intuitively, remember the context are the things at the top of, of the tree or of the DAG. And so I can say, well, this context happens with probably one third. This one happens with probably two thirds and so on. Um, now I can compute the harm in each context because the definition talks about what's the harm in context U. So Yushai, this is exactly the default can also depend on, on the context so that when I'm computing the harm in a particular context, it, I would use the default for that context, right? Defaults can be context dependent. Um, although often they're not, I mean, simpler model says they're not, but, but I mean, don't. Yes. Um, and again, in last week's talk, I, I did exactly that. Let me explain why you'd want to do that. So that, that um, there are two places you can put the probability on the context and on the model. If you're putting it on the model, it's saying, look, I don't know whether smoking causes cancer. I'm uncertain about the equations. So I can imagine two models, one where smoking causes cancer so that the equation for cancer has smoking as a parent, um, and a different model where there's a gene that causes you to want to smoke and, and, and to get cancer, 
So you'll see a correlation between smoking and cancer, but there's no causal connection. And people thought this was the right model, or at least there existed people who thought this was the right model. R.A. Fisher, you know, a famous statistician apparently did back in the 40s and 50s. So it's not crazy. But anyway, in, in general, we're uncertain about how the equations work. So you can think of the model as encoding the equations and the context is encoding, well, what actually happened? Did you smoke or not, right? So you can certainly have a probably both on models and on context. But what it's worth is a technical matter, you can make the model rich enough. So there's a single model, but it's more natural typically to think of there's being different models with different sets of equations and you're uncertain. So a long answer to your question, but the short answer is yes, we can allow the, the uncertainty on the models and, and, and you should. I would put all, I would move all the probabilities back to the context. So the other place, exactly, exactly. So think of it as an adversary where once you fix the adversary, all the decisions of the adversary are deterministic and you have a probability on adversaries. It just makes things technically much easier. So we can't model quantum mechanics where actually the transitions are probabilistic. Um, I mean, quantum mechanics, do folks say, it really isn't the case that you can pull it out. This is like Bell's paradox and stuff. But ignoring that, um, it, it, there's a non-trivial non issues here. But so for the purpose of this talk, probably is on context, only on context. But I'm perfectly okay with having a probability on models. You know. Yes, uh, that's a way of thinking about it. Um, okay, let me keep going. So I'm not kicked out at noon with with more slides to say. Um, what I want to say is uh, we can have uncertainty about the context. So I'm perfectly okay with the probability on context. So you could certainly figure out expected utility because I have a utility on outcomes. You could do standard decision theory to figure out expected utility. Multiply the probability by the utility of the outcome. It's different from expected harm. Let me explain um, by giving you an example. So suppose the doctor has a choice of prescribing medication. So X equals one if he prescribes it, X equals, or, or performing surgery, X equals zero on a patient. Let's say the medication keeps the patient stable, but doesn't completely cure the patient. Um, so that's outcome one, where the patient's stable, but not completely cured. The surgery would completely cure the patient. That's outcome zero with probably one minus P, but there's a small probability of the patient dying. That's outcome two. Uh, you know, surgeries all, always have a small probability of death. Think of P as being very small. So assume I've, I've made up these numbers. Uh, I wanted the utility to be in the zero one range. So you get the highest possible utility if, um, did I have this back? Right, you have the highest possible utility with outcomes one, the patient's completely cured. You have the lowest possible utility of zero. If the patient dies, that's this. Uh, and let's say that, that if the patient continues to be stable, um, but not completely cured, that's outcome one as utility 0.5. Again, you can play with these numbers. There's nothing special about these numbers, but with these choice of numbers, the expected utility of action X equals one, prescribing the medication, well, for sure it keeps the patient stable. So you get outcome one with probability one, and the expected utility is one times 0.5 is 0.5. The expected utility of the surgery, that's x equals zero. Well, with probability p, you get the horrible outcome of dying, of utility zero. With probability one minus p, you get the happy outcome that everything is fine. So the expected utility is one minus p. Again, think of p as being very small. So for reasonable choices of p, Performing the surgery maximizes expected utility. Again, if you don't like these numbers, play with them. But the point is, you can clearly make P small enough that the expected utility is maximized by the surgery. Right? Are we together? That's trivial. But now let's look at harm. If the default utility is one, which intuitively says, remember, one is the perfect outcome, surgery works. If the default utility is one, so the agent intuitively expects to be healthy, then the harm caused by just continuing with the medication is 0.5 because he's 0.5 away from one, right? And the expected harm caused by 
the surgery is P, because with probability P, he gets outcome zero that, that causes harm of one. Uh, and with probability one minus P, he is happy. So again, minimizing expected harm with this choice of default utility says you should perform the surgery just as it does if you're doing expected utility. But, but suppose you decided, you know, you've been taking this medication for a long time. Yeah, it's okay. It's not great. And your default is 0.5. The life will continue as it is, where you're feeling okay, not perfect, which is not unreasonable if you've been taking the medication for a while. You're not expecting 100, you know, your expect, default expectation is not 100% cure, but to keep going the way you are, 0.5. What happens then? Is that the next slide or is that this one? Right. So if the default utility is 0.5, then continuing with the current treatment, x equals one, has expected harm zero, because you get 0.5. It's what you were expecting all along, no harm, right? Notice the difference between this. If I'm expecting to be 100% perfect, continuing with the current treatment, there is harm. But if my expectation is 0.5, there's no harm. Whereas if you perform the surgery, well, there is a small chance of harm. You might die. Okay, it's small, but... Um, so the choice that minimizes harm is to continue with the current treatment, which keeps you stable, doesn't give you surgery. Now let's talk about real people. Uh, you know, what should they take their default as? And I can imagine a difference between people. You know, there's the patients had this treatment for a long time, perfectly, you know, not great, but it's okay. Their default is 0.5 and they avoid surgery. Why mess around? I'm doing okay with my treatment. There's a chance that I might die with a surgery. Bad things might happen, even if it's small. I'm risk averse. I continue with my treatment. I'm trying to minimize expected harm. Whereas if I've been healthy all my life, I can't stand this, this medication, even though it's keeping me okay. My expectation is that I'll, you know, be jogging, you know, and riding my bike, and I can't do that with this. I expect one. I'm going for the surgery. More harm if I continue with my treatment. I'm not talking about right or wrong here. My point is, these are two perfectly reasonable people with different defaults. I, I think we all know people like this, right? The, the, there's the one who's risk averse, continues with the current treatment. Um, we explain it in this model of harm. My point is, with expected utility, there's no question. Do the surgery. He is small. Whereas with expected harm, you get a different answer, which I claim is not an unreasonable answer. And indeed, I say, I know people like this, and I, I don't think they're irrational, even if they're not maximizing expected utility. They're minimizing expected harm, at least in our framework. Does that make sense? But again, notice that how much is depending on your default. These two models are identical, except for the default. Um, so for the rest of the talk, the last few minutes, I just want to talk about subtleties that arise. Sorry, question. Right. That's an excellent question. And it's going to be a general question with our theory for policymakers. Uh, and that's outside the scope of the model. I escaped the question by saying, not my problem, don't look at me. But I, you know, if you buy our model, this says there's a serious role, you know, you need a, I would assume the AI gets together a panel of experts and they spend a lot of time discussing what the default ought to be. This happened in the US when you're talking about what's an acceptable level of death, you know, how safe should we make cars, right? You can spend a lot of money and make cars a little bit safer. What's the trade-off between increasing the probability of death, by, you know, from 0 0.003 to 0 0.002, decreasing the probability of death, but it will cost you a lot more in terms of, and, and people actually do this. They have a panel that assigns a cost to death and, and looks at whether or not it's worth it, right? Where do they come up with their numbers? Well, you know, I, they have ways of coming up with these numbers. I have the same answer here, that it's outside the scope of the model. It is absolutely not a trivial question. I don't want to minimize the difficulty and the importance. Uh, I, I have nothing to say about it, but 
Um, but that's how I expect it to happen in the real world. Right, or, or you should minimize harm, you know. Right, I mean, again, if you say no harm, then you can't, you know, I mean, so in practice, I think it'll be, uh, we're willing to tolerate this teeny probability of harm, but that's all. Um, so let me just say a few words about probability weighting, especially if there's people, psychologists in the audience. Uh, so research has shown, let's say, that the probability of a fatal accident when driving at the speed limit is one in a million. I'm making up these numbers, but qualitatively, you know, you'll, you'll see the point. Driving at 80% of the speed limit results in 50% fewer fatal accidents than driving at the speed limit. So the probability of a fatal accident when driving at 80% of the speed limit is one in two million. It's just math. The majority of the people drive at the speed limit and would prefer buying an autonomous car that does so as well. And that preference remains even after people have been informed of these numbers. Again, I made up the numbers, but, but qualitatively this is true, right? That uh, now, so an autonomous car company needs to decide whether their car should drive at the maximum speed allowed by the speed limit, call that X equals one, or at 80% of the speed limit. Um, like for a given trip, let's say, let's simplify stuff. There are three outcomes. The driver arrives safely in the quickest legal way possible so that, you know, the car is driving at the speed limit. That's two. They get there quickly. They're safe. Uh, o equals one is if the driver arrives safely at his destination, but takes a bit more time. Intuitively, you're driving at 80% of the speed limit. O equals zero if the car crashes and dies. That's bad. I made up these numbers. The numbers don't, the details don't matter. But with reasonable choice of numbers, um, maximizing expected utility results in a preference for x equals zero, driving at 8% of the speed limit. As long as you sign a low enough negative utility to death, right? Make up your numbers. But as long as death is horrible enough, you'd much, you'd much rather, as far as expected utility goes, drive at 80% of the speed limit, cutting your probability of dying by half rather than driving at the speed limit, okay, you get there a bit faster, but, but you're twice as likely to die, right? So it's easy to make up numbers that make this work. Let's not worry about the details of my numbers. Um, so maximizing expected utility says you should drive at 80% of the speed limit. It doesn't help, harm doesn't change anything. Minimizing harm leads to the same preference, um, even if you change the default. What's going on here? Well. There's a lot of work in the psych community going back to Kahneman and Tversky again, they seem to show up everywhere, um, that people ignore the possibility of a fatal accident. So basically, one way of understanding what people are doing is they're taking that probability of a fatal accident, which was one in a million, 10 to the minus six, and treating it as zero. And so decision theorists have a way of dealing with this. There's an approach due to John Quiggin, a well-known decision theorist. Um, he looks at RDEU. Oy, what's RDEU? It's, sorry? Rank dependent expected utility. Um, that, that there's a whole theory that says instead of using, um, uh, instead of using expected utility, you take the probabilities and weight them by a function uh, and, and use the weighted version of the probability instead of the actual probability. And in this case, you could say the weighted version of the 10th to the minus six is zero. People are treating the P as a WP, treating the 10th to the minus six as zero when they're doing the calculation. Why are they doing this? Well, if I think back, you know, which of my friends has died of speeding? Come on, give me a break. Um, that, that you sort of look back at your data and, and clearly if you treat the 10th to the minus six as zero, go at the speed limit. Right? What's the point in, in going 80% of the speed limit? Now, interestingly, so there's a paper by my colleagues, John Kleinberg, um, actually these were all people at, at Cornell. Uh, Heda Hedawi was a postdoc there. She's now at UPenn. Um, but um, Karen Levy and, 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 and John Kleinberg are at Cornell. They, they look at a bunch of other problems involving harm and they assume that people overweight probabilities. So here I was underweighting the probability, but they were assuming people were overweighting. Now it's interesting, there's a quote from Conor and Trisky that say, because people are limited in their abilities 
to comprehend and evaluate extreme probabilities, very high, very low probabilities, highly unlikely events are either neglected, underweighted, or overweighted. And the difference between high probability and certainty is either neglected or exaggerated. Uh, thus, small probabilities generate unpredictable behavior. Indeed, we observe two opposite reactions to small probabilities. Sometimes you underweight, sometimes you overweight. Uh, the most common explanation is that people underweight probabilities when they make decisions from experience, like based on their past experience. Um, so, you know, none of my friends has died from speeding. But if I had a close friend who died last week of speeding, you know, they got in, you know, they were, they were going too fast and, and had an accident and, and horrible things happened. All of a sudden, I'm not treating that 10 to the minus 6 as 0. I'm treating it as more like 10 to the minus 3. Yeah, for the next week, exactly. For a little while, you overweight. So the question of whether you underweight or overweight depends very much on your experiences and your sampling of the data. Um, but they found that by and large, when people make decisions from experience based on their past experience, they underweight and they overweight when they make decisions from description. So these are the types of situations studied in the lab where I get a story. That's what they mean by description. In other words, I hand you the story. Here's the story. What are you going to do? Um, and so, you know, as I say, that the, the Hedari Barocas, Kleinberg, and Levy assumed overweighting. We're agnostic, but these issues arise. Uh, we have more to say about it in the paper, but not much. Let me just conclude and leave a few minutes for questions saying, you know, up to now, I've, I've looked at the harm caused to a single individual. But if you're a policymaker, typically you're going to be concerned with societal harm, right? You're trying to decide what's your policy on vaccinating this group of people? What's your policy as the U.S. had to decide? Who am I going to call an essential worker and say they have to go back to work, whereas everybody else can stay home, right? This is during COVID, right? And clearly calling somebody an essential worker could cause them harm. They're much more likely to be exposed to, to COVID. This is true. That happened. But you could argue for society overall, there's a benefit. Here comes benefit that, that um, for people who are stuck at home and can't go out and do their shopping, having somebody who can deliver food, that's a major benefit. So they look at the benefits, they look at the harms, and, and you know, they somehow sum them up and, and figure out societal harm, right? That's more or less what they're doing. Um, but it's not so straightforward. Well, first, let me give you an easy example. Um, so using appropriate default solves some problems. So suppose Billy's healthy, strolling by a hospital. This is a standard problem. In the hospital, there are five patients in need of a heart. You, those of you who know the trolley problem, this is just a variant of the trolley problem. Live, you know, but there are five patients who need a heart, liver, kidney, lung, and pancreas transplant, respectively. Suppose that the patients will die without the transplant, and Billy has will die if these organs are harvested from him, but he's got liver, kidney, lung, and heart, and pancreas, right? So what should we do? Well, expect the utility maximization, at least if you're looking myopically, says, take Billy, capture him. Uh, I mean, there are gangs that do this, but it's not legal, uh, and cut him open and take out his pancreas and liver and heart, transplant them. Okay, Billy dies. You lose one person, but you save five people. So as I say, those of you familiar with the trolley problem, this is essentially that, that way. Um, that, but you could say, okay, um, expect a utility under reasonable choices for utility. If you're looking myopically and not looking at the long-term impact of kidnapping people, uh, says that you should kidnap Billy and, and, and use the parts, right? If we take, on the other hand, with harm, you don't get that answer. If you take the default to be that Billy and each of the patients continue in their current state, right? My default is that I'm just going to go on the way I am. In that case, harvesting Billy's organs harms Billy. Uh, he's not, not alive anymore, uh, but doesn't help anybody else because their default was they continue in their current state. So kidnapping Billy increases the level of, increases the harm. Right, so harm works differently from utility here. So harm maybe is useful for this problem, but defaults don't solve all problems. 
And, and here there's an interesting and deep connection which we're exploring now that I haven't made precise, but let me bring it up. There's a huge literature in AI, as I suspect many of you know, on fairness. What are fair things to do? Um, and fairness also looks at what looks like harm. It's unfair to treat men and women differently when it comes to loans, when it comes to jobs, right? So there's, there's all this stuff on fairness. There seems to be somewhat, something very similar going on here that argues against just aggregating utilities. So if you take the normal approach in decision theory, but decision theorists realize there, that there are problems that even assuming that I'm gonna, that, that I can compare my utility with your utility, what's my five compared to your five? But suppose all utilities are commensurate, that I can compare utilities. And the way I compute societal harm is by just summing up the harm for everybody. That misses out on the fact that some groups could be disproportionately harmed. So again, in the, in the COVID era, when some people were deemed essential workers and they had to go back to work. So they came up with a policy. The policy didn't distinguish men and women, didn't distinguish white and black, but in practice, the essential workers were far more likely to be black than white were far more likely to be poor, coming from a poor socio socioeconomic background than wealthy. I mean, I was not essential. I'm a professor. I get to stay home. Um, so that what happened is effectively that certain groups are disproportionately harmed. Certain identifiable groups are disproportionately harmed when you do this kind of a calculation. And this starts to feel like the fairness literature that how can you ensure now we're not talking about men versus women, but how can you, you know, how do you take into account disproportionate harm among certain groups? If you're trying to decide where to build a, a freeway and you build it right through the middle of town, you know, some people have to get displaced. Invariably, they turn out to be black and poor, right? That, that, um, so that, that you are max, you know, you can take a policy that minimizes total societal harm if you treat everybody the same way, but has a disproportionate impact in certain groups. So the question is, well, there are two technical questions. A, how do you do something about that? And we have some suggestions in the paper, but I'm not crazy about them, so I'll skip that. Those are very much in the spirit of, you know, how do you make decisions so as not to harm, let's say, women rather than men. This feels somewhat similar. It's not exactly the same but understanding the technical connections is actually interesting. So let me stop there. As I said, this was a more philosophical talk. Oh, I promise we harm versus benefits. So, uh, uh, so in many situations, we need to trade off benefits versus harms. People do that all the time. Most people seem to do ben benefit, view benefit as the opposite of harm. So I could just use the equations and you know, take a default and, and you know, look at how much above the default you are instead of how much below the default you are. The amount below is the harm, the amount above is the benefit. My point is that maybe you might have in some cases an acceptable range for tips. So an amount below the lower amount is harm, an amount above the higher amount is a benefit, but there's this gap. And in fact, I think we, we do that to some, so that if you're, if dh equals db, if you've just got a point, then indeed harm and benefit are symmetric around the point. Above it, it's benefit, below it, it's harm. But there's no a priori reason, and I think there is psychological reason, but again, I, this is work to be done, um, to, to assume that dh equals db. That, that you can assume that you've got a range, below the lower amount is harm, above the higher amount it's, it's benefit, but they're, the lower amount and the higher amount aren't equal. So. We don't have, we allow that. Um, you could take them to be equal. And I think in practice, this is often done, but it's not clear it matches psychology in some cases. So, okay, let me stop so I can finish by noon. I, I'm just about there. We've given a definition of quantitative and qualitative harm. It's relatively straightforward in the case of a single individual, but lots of issues arise with multiple individuals. I, I particularly, for me, the most interesting one is how to deal with disproportionate harm to certain groups. Um, 
So lots of work needs to be done. And, and what I would really love to do, and I'm starting to talk to people about this, is look, I've given a technical definition with a model. How does this relate to what people actually, how people actually think? And I think there is, I mean, I, I tried to say that the notion of default really does make, seem to match what people do. Um, so, you know, if the EU is gonna come up with a definition of harm and it doesn't match what people do, yes, I see the class out there, um, that, that it better match. Um, and so there needs to be work done in cognitive psychology to understand how people apply the word harm. I believe that our definition will match pretty well, but that's research to be done. Um, and then there's all these other issues about relating harm and fairness. So let me stop. What about non-probabilistic representations of uncertainty? I've assumed for this talk that I'm representing uncertainty by, by a single probability distribution. There's lots of work in decision theory and other areas about alternate representations, multi-attribute utilities, taking into account complexity. So there's lots more to be done. This is still in the early stages. Let me stop there before I get run over by these people. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm,